Welcome back to If I Knew You Better. I'm Brendan Davis, your host, and I'm very excited to be back from our summer break. And wow, do I have an episode for you today. My guest this week is Mr. Christopher Vogler. Chris is very well known in the worlds of screenwriting and Hollywood and kind of writing in general for being the author of a book called The Writer's Journey. The subtitle has drifted around a bit over the years, but the essential plot line is Mythic Structure for Writers. And this book really took the world by storm when it was first published, and it has not stopped being a massive influence in the decades since. The 25th anniversary edition is coming out very soon from Michael Weesey Productions. And Chris and I had what I think was it's becoming a bit of a trend, actually. I'm really enjoying interviewing authors. This is not an author-specific podcast, although it has drifted into more of an entertainment-specific podcast and people from that world. And with authors especially, though, there's something about the process of sitting and contemplating words for posterity and putting them on a page that is is something that a certain kind of a mind does, and it's something that I think a certain kind of a mind that, that does it well makes them an especially interesting person for me to talk to, at least. Now, in case you have not heard of Christopher Vogler's book previously, The Writer's Journey is a reference in name to The Hero's Journey, which is the primary thesis uncovered by Joseph Campbell in his seminal book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And we cover this very thoroughly within the actual interview, so I don't need to say too much, and it's a very long interview. I've cut out very little of it, but I think the whole thing is really interesting and engaging, and I didn't want to cut anything that I didn't have to, basically. So it's here in almost in its entirety for you to enjoy. But the hero's journey, of course, has been exemplified in movies over the years, most specifically in Star Wars, starting with the original Star Wars. But you see the hero's journey as the primary structure, this mythic structure derived from thousands of stories told over thousands of years throughout history by all these different cultures. And of course, the Marvel movies exemplify the hero's journey these days. There are other kinds of journey. There is the virgin's journey, which has been written about extensively. We mentioned that in here. And there are these other types of stories, but the hero's journey is really resonant in a lot of ways. Now, I asked for questions from my kind of greater network of writer folks. I put it out on my various social media and my different uh, groups that I track in and ask, you know, everyone from just talented casual writers to professional writer friends weighed in and augmented the questions I already had, which was really great. So thank you if you participated in that. And if you didn't, follow me on the socials, and you can be part of this next time I uh, source, (laughs) next time I crowdsource some, some questions for the guests. But what's interesting is I did have one friend sort of asking, you know, is he, you know, is he, is Chris Vogler still really, really sort of stuck on the hero's journey, as he put it, which wasn't meant to be rude, and I don't mean it to be rude to say it this way, to repeat it, but, um, or is he looking toward the future? And I, and as you will hear, not only is Chris very much aware of all the other world of storytelling, but he himself is looking at really interesting new ways for writers to connect stories to audiences. And some are related to the hero's journey and some are not. And I don't want to spoil the surprise, but the last 10 or so minutes of this especially kind of blew my mind, frankly, when he dropped what he's working on. So anyway, I don't want to set this up too much. And I don't think you'd be let down no matter what I say, frankly. But I want to get right to it. It's a long show. We are going to do a round two. We also realized at the end how much more we have to talk about. And we decided, you know what? That'll be the sequel. Don't forget to visit crazyinagoodway.com, which is my website. You can find out more about everything there, and I will have updates via my socials about not only this episode, but the follow-up episode whenever we get around to doing that. But for now, please enjoy round one, this interview with Christopher Vogler. Christopher Vogler, how are you doing this fine Los Angeles morning? Uh, extremely well. Yeah, I've got a great view of the city, and uh, it's bustling this morning, but I'm not in it. So <laughs> I don't have to bustle. You don't have I to like. bustle. That's a, that's a yeah. good place to be when you've got the view and you have no need to bustle anymore. Um, yeah. We have, of course, just heard a bit about you from my introduction, and we're going to talk an awful lot about how you got to be who you are. But I always like to start by asking people to introduce themselves. How how do you introduce yourself to people who you would like to know better, who maybe don't you know know your actual story? 
Yes, uh, if if I'm dealing with someone who's not in the film business, I have to dance around a little bit and uh, explain the explanation. You know, mm-hmm. I I tell people, even my parents had trouble understanding technically what I was doing most of my career <laughs> in Hollywood. Right. But uh, I tell people that I uh, was a story analyst, and they're blank, uh, and I say that that's somebody who reads the scripts. Uh, first, you know, the, reads mm-hmm. the manuscripts, the novels, the comic books, whatever it is that somebody is pushing in front of a studio saying, this is uh, a good piece of material. And somebody has to read that. Somebody is the front line. So I was part of a small army of people who did that job called a uh, reader or story analyst. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we basically read the stuff and write reports. It's like writing book reports in school. Uh, but you're you're aimed at the executive class, and you're trying to winnow through things and find the best stuff for them, or the parts of the best stuff. Even like maybe half a script is good, or a mm-hmm. character is good, and you're trying to draw attention to that, or you're trying to shoot down the project and just get it off the plate because it's not right for your studio, or mm-hmm. just isn't isn't uh, isn't something anybody wants to see. So I I was that. And people will misinterpret that and and go, oh, I see you're a copy editor. You changed the punctuation and so forth. And I go, no, no, it's a little more. (laughs) Oh, if it were that simple. (laughs) Yeah, it's a little more literary than that, you know, where I'm I'm really helping them make decisions. And then I got into it more deeply and became a consultant, um, which means that I was uh, now working on the, the projects, once the studio said, yes, we want to do it, and we're going to put some money down on this, uh, then they get serious about it and really take uh, apart the material uh, line by line. And so I had the kind of mind that was good for that detailed uh, analysis mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, had a, a broad range of knowledge about history and literature and so forth. So I was able to bring uh, some understanding to almost anything they threw at me and uh, was good at it. So that's that's what I and I also tell people, OK, I worked on The Lion King and then I go, oh, then I get the reaction, you know, mm-hmm. people go, oh, and. So it, it's a, kind of a shorthand that helps me explain who I am. Very, very nice. Well, let's talk about how you came to be in possession of the knowledge and skills and interests that led you to be useful in that way. And, you know, how you I know I know from our conversation before that you're you know big history buff, for instance. What do you really consider to be your roots that sets you on this path to, you know, the world of story. And, uh, yeah, let's, let's kind of take it back for a few minutes before we get into the, uh, into the more well-known history. Sure. You know, I grew up, uh, pretty far outside the orbit of Hollywood in Missouri. I was, uh, a kid living in the suburbs of St. Louis, um, until I was about 12, and then we moved out to a, even further out from civilization, out to a farm about 40 miles outside of St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really felt isolated, and uh, I was away from all my friends and so forth. So I took refuge in uh, books and stories, science fiction stories mostly, and uh, history and the movies, uh, and particularly the drive-in movies that we would go to. Mm-hmm. We would drive into St. Louis, uh, into the suburbs on uh, the weekends and watch a couple of films outdoors and it was just magical to me and i wanted to be in that and another thing that was important i think is that my mother was a big reader and the house was just full of books and um it to her it was uh you know like eating and drinking it was a a normal part of uh everyday life And I knew being an author or having something to do with this world of stories was important. It was valued. So I wanted, because of her, I think, I wanted to be in it somehow. And I Mm -hmm. I didn't quite know how to get there from the farm on Missouri. But uh, I I knew that was uh, something, if I had my way, that's where I was going to go. And so I took uh, a pathway that was as close to that as I could get from where I started, <laughs> yeah. uh, which which meant um, I went to uh, journalism school at the University of Missouri. I studied whatever film classes they had, which weren't many, uh, but I learned to edit film and uh, you know, news footage and so forth. 
So, uh, you know, I took uh, basic film classes where I saw Birth of a Nation and uh, Charlie Chaplin movies and sure. the, the basics and, um, you know, followed that trail. And then I got into, uh, this is during the Vietnam War, so I joined up uh, with the Air Force, ROTC, and the Air Force, when I graduated, sent me out to Los Angeles, and I was just phenomenally lucky. That's mm-hmm. one of the, the the spaces in life where you just have to say uh, you you benefited from good luck. Yeah. Uh, because they, they could have sent me anywhere on the globe. They could have sent me to Vietnam. They could have sent right. me to you know an, a, any variety of horrible places. But uh, instead, they sent me to Los Angeles. <laughs> and uh, that's amazing. I worked. I worked for uh, a, a small outfit that was part of the think tank of the Air Force for military and space matters, and they were working on the early development of the space shuttle, which was an Air Force program at that time, mm-hmm. and uh, the GPS system wow. had not been launched yet, but they were developing it for military use so the, the soldiers could find out where they were on, on the map. And uh, I made documentary films about those things. So that uh, launched me into, you know, having my hands on and also being exposed to um, a lot of people who had been cameramen and editors during World War II. They were okay. still around working for the military, uh, civilians, but working for the military. And uh, that was a fantastic uh, mentorship program for me to be around these veterans. And, you know, there were guys who had been blown up on the decks of, uh, carriers during world war two in the Pacific, uh, you know, doing, uh, combat photography. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was a, a rich background uh, for me and, uh, a nice way to, uh, to get into it. And then I asked around when it was time to leave, uh, it, where should I go to school uh, mm-hmm. for graduate school? Mm-hmm. And they said, either USC or UCLA were probably the <laughs> best bets. And I ended yeah. up getting into USC. So that was uh, an important, uh, important step for me. And I eventually got into the, the film school there. So in terms of actually transitioning from military life to civilian life and actually student life, well, what was it like for you at uh, at SC? If we, if you don't mind carbon dating you a, a, just a bit, kind of, kind of what? Uh, so this was post Vietnam. You were at SC. Well, what was it yeah. like? What was it like back then? What, what was the what was the environment? Well, it was funny because um, they had been through at the school uh, a lot of turmoil mm-hmm. uh, during the late '60s, and this was now the early '70s. By the time I got there, and the professors were actually a little disappointed in this new crop because we weren't revolutionaries and we were just (laughs) interested in getting into the film business. Mm. And, uh, I was a little bit of a hippie at post, uh, the air force. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was rebellious to the extent that I never got my degree, for example, because I protested. Uh, I felt that they had some of their practices uh, or or favoritism of students was unfair. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time, if you went into the faculty and cried, yeah. They would give you an A, you know, oh. and uh, because they didn't want the trouble. So right. uh, I, I, I got uh, on the wrong end of that a few times and didn't like it. So I was a bit of a rebel. But it was important to me for a number of, of reasons. One thing was it identified um, my skill. Uh, we were standing around in the first week or so. We had to come up with an idea for a film, and uh, we were standing around, and somebody mentioned his idea, which was about uh, a grandfather who suddenly has a grandson dumped on his doorstep, and he has to take care of the kid. Okay. And I just, this thing came in my head, and I said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the two met each other before we knew that? And oh. like the kid ran into him with a skateboard or something, mm-hmm. and he didn't know it was his grandson, and he already hated the kid, and the kid hated <laughs> oh, him. Oh man! Yeah. And then they find out that they're uh, related, and that the grandfather has to take care of him. And everybody in the little crowd went, "Wow, that's good." <laughs> yeah, that's a good twist. And it was the first time I, I had that experience, and the rush of realizing. I, for some reason, I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. I know how Mm -hmm. to take an existing story 
And just from a, a few lines, somebody throwing out the rough idea, I, I was like a surgeon. I just knew, yeah. oh, you, you cut here and you, you insert this here and you move this over here and you flip that over there. And uh, it, it just came to me. And so uh, I, I got excited about that and said, hmm, maybe there's something I can do with this. And then uh, there were two things in school. One, I took a very important class called uh, Story Analysis for Film and TV. Mm -hmm. And that told me what to do with this skill. So uh, the, the class was about how the studios communicate and how people write these uh, book reports, what they call coverage right. of scripts that come in. So I had to do that, and I turned out to be good at that. Uh, we had to write longer notes on a project that the studio was definitely investing in, uh, and I turned out to be good at that. So that was uh, an, an entryway uh, into a job path for me, uh, which was, you know, a source of some anxiety as a student. You don't know how am I going to make a living at this sure. while I'm getting ready to, you know, uh, receive my Academy Award. So I, uh, <laughs> yeah, you had so, to, you had to do something to pass the time between getting fitted for your tux and that's right. <laughs> so, uh, that gave me this career path. And then the second thing was, um, I ran into the ideas of Joseph Campbell, uh, mm -hmm. who was this uh, American mythologist who had written in the uh, late forties about the, um, uh, the, the persistence of one pattern in mythology, which is this hero's journey idea. And then I eventually, as you may know, turned mm -hmm. that into my entire uh, adult career. Sure. Uh, explaining for filmmakers what was in this rather dense uh, uh, academic and poetic book that, that Campbell had written. Uh, and that was a huge breakthrough. Right, uh, right. What, what what happened was we were in a class, a film noir class, and we were looking at a particular film, and I said something in the discussion about how the film had a mythic dimension or something. Mm -hmm. And the professor said, what do you mean? I said, well, I really don't know. I just I have this sense there's something from mythology going on here. And he pointed me, this professor, to the school library and said, go get the hero with a thousand faces, mm -hmm. Campbell's book. And uh, I flipped through it uh, on on the bus on the way home. Mm -hmm. And that's another skill of mine is that I can quickly absorb things. I can flip through something and I kind of get it. I understand what mm -hmm. the thesis is. So by the time I got off the bus, my life was completely changed uh, because I had been looking for what's in Campbell, which is a map Mm -hmm. of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of a map of the brain. I never thought of it that way before, but but that's what it is. It's it's kind of a map of uh what happens inside the brain, um what what we're looking for in stories and why we relate to them. Uh and so it just was like poured out into my lap. Here is every question you've been asking uh answered. And I, I had started to sketch in little pieces of my map for myself mm -hmm. because I'd noticed certain films had similarities and, and there were patterns that you would see repeated in Westerns and film war and comedy. And you'd see the same kind of scene. Uh, but Campbell just, just offered, here's the whole thing completely dissected mm -hmm. and described, uh, but in sort of poetic terms. And the lucky, again, lucky break for me is that right after I read this book, about two weeks later, the first Star Wars movie came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the the school uh, was connected with Lucas had, had been there. Sure. Uh, so it was connected with him. He went about 10 years before I got there. And uh, he was friendly to the school and he invited everybody to come to the Fox the movie lot to see this new film. And we thought he was out of his mind, uh, <laughs> doing a science fiction movie at that time. This yeah. is the days of e easy rider. Sure. Uh, and nobody was doing science fiction. Uh, and even the description in variety sounded old fashioned, it's, you know, princess Leah Organa of the universe. Mm -hmm. It sounded like some dusty old flash Gordon serial from the 1930s. And uh, so we went to see it and were completely blown away right? Uh, and speechless. Nobody could say anything. But it was a special experience for me because I was sitting there tracking Campbell's st 
stages because he talks about the hero going through different stages and it was all there exactly as Campbell described it. So I began to suspect, hmm, maybe George Lucas has read Joseph Campbell and it turns out he had and sure. that it was a big influence on him as many people know. So uh, that really uh, cemented the idea for me because I suspected as soon as I opened Campbell, I said, this is commercial. This is right. useful today, and it's not some dusty old uh, theory from, from academics that has no use to anybody. This is really, really powerful uh, and, and right of today. Mm -hmm. And there it was. So uh, I, I was encouraged by that. I wrote a paper about it. Uh, and uh, how I, I said that there was a renaissance in heroism right. because it had nearly died after the Vietnam War. And we went from worshiping John Wayne in World War II to being disgusted yeah, by him. Yeah, reviling him, yeah. Yeah, in, uh, I think the, the movie, the, the Green Berets, was the, the one where everybody of my generation just went, oh, forget it, man, you're, you're incredibly... Uh, out of it. You just don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, heroism was being revived through close encounters. Uh, I found something about it in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, a little earlier, but uh, those three films seemed to me to be a revival of this heroic uh, form. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wrote, I wrote this this paper about that. And I carried that paper with me when I started working for the studios as mm -hmm. a reader, as a, a script analyst, and showed it to various people, trying to get people to talk about it, because I just thought, man, this is so fascinating. This is so useful. Um, it, it, has anybody else heard about this? What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. So I used it as a kind of a, a flag that I waved as I uh, went from studio to studio. So uh, and then eventually, uh, just to follow through on this, I uh, decided at some point, I'd been working for the studios for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and um, I decided this Campbell thing won't let me go. So I'm going to actually withdraw for a little bit from the studio life and just go off and figure it out. Uh, and make a statement about it uh, in memo form that mm -hmm. would lay out, okay, this is what I think it is for filmmakers, and, and try to uh, distill from Campbell's very complex, uh, verbose, uh, uh, poetic <laughs> way of, yeah. of, of talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I've read the source. It's, 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 not, it's not the easy reader to get through that. No, it's uh, I, I liken it to uh, kissing the Blarney Stone in Ireland. You know, <laughs> yeah. In, in, it's a journey you know, to, to get there. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to uh, get a gift of gab. You're supposed to be uh, able to speak more eloquently once you have kissed the Blarney Stone. But to kiss the Blarney Stone, you have to get to Blarney, which isn't easy, and then you have to climb the tower and lean out over a parapet with your head hanging down and kiss the underside mm -hmm. of the stone that's embedded in the wall walk. And it's an athletic, uh, you know, gymnastic feat to do that. So uh, it was like that for Campbell. Uh, reading Campbell is a bit of a gymnastic feat uh, and, and getting anything out of it. And I found a lot of people in the studio had encountered Campbell's ideas in mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. uh, there were even copies of his book on the shelves of some of the executives' offices. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had some wonderful conversations, but it wasn't until I backed off and wrote it up into right. this me memo form. Yeah, your seven pager. I've got a, I've got a copy of it online here. A, a practical guide to the hero with a thousand faces by Joseph Campbell. Yes, that's that's correct. That's how I called it, and. Um, you know, a little of the background of that is that um, we were in a memo writing culture at that mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been, I started at uh, Fox and a couple of smaller studios and then eventually ended up at Disney. And it was at Disney that I wrote this memo. And uh, we were under uh, the influence of uh, very uh, wonderful talent, uh, fabulous mm -hmm. Uh, creative guy named Jeffrey Katzenberg. Sure, sure. Uh, who 
was in charge of production for the studio at that time. And he uh, also was in charge of the revival of animation, which had almost died uh, in the years after Walt Disney's death. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he brought it back to life uh, and had a string of hits going already with Beauty and the Beast and uh, uh, Aladdin and and, uh, a few other films that, that Little Mermaid uh, that had gotten animation back on its feet again. Mm-hmm. So he was a great memo writer, and I uh, studied his technique of writing memos, uh, which was very diplomatic and very uh, clear and simple. He would just lay things out with bullet points, and he would do it military style, mm-hmm. which means um, first I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, mm-hmm. then I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you, yeah. And then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Right. So right. he would he would start with an introduction, <laughs> yeah. which would give the outline of the memo. Then he would give the points uh, with his arguments diplomatically phrased. And then he would go back and he would review the whole thing and say, these are the two. If you only do two things, do these two things on the right. next draft. Right. It's like it's like the really focused inverted journalism pyramid. But but that. Yeah. That that very specific, the the uh, you know I repetition is one of the most important things to to repeat and I hear repetition is good too so <laughs> that's, that my, is, that's my that's yeah. my bad and version it, of making of, of it of, is yeah yeah it's it's, it's I'd rather hear it three it, times than just twice and if I can hear it more than twice I'd like to hear it three times yeah it's it, it actually is one of the secret principles of the universe mm-hmm. that you don't get anywhere without repeating actions many many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that was, this is a, a bit of a digression, but uh, I think that was very important in getting me to the point where I could write that memo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had by that time read and written reports on about 10,000 screenplays. Wow. That's and, a lot of coverage. Uh, Malcolm, it's a lot of coverage. And uh, I have the filing cabinets to prove <laughs> it. But, uh, you know, uh, the writer and thinker Malcolm Gladwell sure. pointed this out a few years ago, that most people who have mastery over something mm-hmm. have done the thing 10,000 times. Right. Uh, if you're a gem cutter or whatever, you've, you've cut and, you know, probably broken a lot of diamonds, but mm-hmm. uh, you've, you've done it 10,000 times and then you become in some way a master. So I was, I was primed for it uh, by having done that, that task so many times. So uh, I think it rewired my brain in a way, uh, and uh, I think that's what's happening when you do something ten thousand times. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was I was poised and, and ready to launch this thing. Well, I want to ask and, you. Wanna, oh, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. It, it, if if I can jump in on this for just a second, um, mm-hmm. is is I, I was struck by you you saying that um, that you wrote your notes. You know, uh, uh, you know, upon meditating on on Campbell and seeing Lucas and Star Wars and realizing, oh, this is in the air a bit, and seeing the book around and whatnot, but that it was ten years of gestation, but before mm-hmm. you actually published your memo, was was no one really was it was it in the air at all? I mean, were people using it as a reference? I mean, it was, of course, now revisionist. Uh, you know, looking backwards, I mean, of course, everybody dissects Star Wars based on an understanding of the hero's journey. But, but was that in the air at all? I mean, was this something? It's, it sounds like it's something that you really, you know, tied together in a way that no one had explicated it publicly. Is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah it it didn't um, it didn't have the cultural impact yet. Mm. Uh, I have just recently examined all of this, uh, the the sort of uh, dent that Star Wars made in the mind, the creative mind of, uh, of Hollywood or world filmmakers. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I actually wrote a uh, very academic paper for a German journal uh, about Campbell and his influence. And people, some film critics, noticed it right away and wrote about it immediately. Like, oh, this is, it's not a new paradigm, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a refreshment of this old paradigm, and it's probably going to have some impact later on. But that, that sort of vanished from the discourse pretty quickly. Hmm. Uh, and I was actually worried about it because I thought 
this is a fantastic thing. Lucas discovered it, uh, darn it, ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> it, but, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it may be a flash in the pan, and it may be something that makes this little ding in the, the consciousness uh, and people are fascinated by it for a minute, like, oh, there's this old thing, glittering, old, wonderful thing from the old days, and we'll make two or three films about that and then toss it aside. But mm-hmm. it certainly didn't turn out that way. Nice. And it turned out to be the model for uh, all of the superheroes. Sure. Movies, that's for sure. Yeah, we wouldn't have yeah. Marvel Studios doing what it does, for instance, among many other things. Yeah, and, you know, and I I don't claim that it's a direct of course uh, deal that you know they read my book and did that right right uh, but 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 uh, they have <laughs> but they have <laughs> I'll just I'll just and, say it for and you many 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 will say so yeah um, so you know it it, it but it, it did it also took time um, for me to test it. Right, over right. Over again. Like, yeah, so, yeah, the, tell me about that. How did you? How did you sort of begin to codify this 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 framework in your head into something that ended up becoming this reference book that I had in film school back in nineteen ninety, et cetera. Yes, or or well, whatever it was post film school when I actually read it. But but yeah, back in the early days, how how did you go well, from thought to memo to to to, to tome? Well, uh, backing up to my earliest days in the studio system. Um, that was completely sink or swim. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't do any on, they don't do any, you know, orientation or here's how to do it or anything. Sure. They might give you a sample of somebody else's coverage. Uh, but basically they just fling you in the pool. Yeah. Figure it and, out. Uh, yeah. So the only life preserver I had was, uh, this, uh, formula or, or way of looking at things that Campbell had. And from day one, it was helping me to uh, get orientation and say, this particular story in my hand um, is missing something. There's nobody the hero can turn to or talk to. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe that's a good thing in some stories, but uh, in in this story, it uh, it creates problems. So I had something um, to compare to all the time. I had a target of uh, what would be a a healthy, well-functioning story. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it took that time to write these uh, thousands of uh, reports and, and look at every angle in every genre. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that was something that helped me, I think, to synthesize it all eventually. Uh, it sort of clicked one day uh, that, you know, this people want to put it in a box and say, oh, I get it. The hero's journey works for adventure. It works for uh, fantasy. It works for science fiction. But it's not going to work for comedies and romances and you know serious mm. dramas. And I said, no, it works for all those things too. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, can get you out of a jam or, or guide you to something a little better. So uh, that's that's how we got to uh, to that that stage. Uh, where I was, I just felt ready to do that. And the, the procedure, once I made that decision, I quit my job for a while. And I went to New York to hang out with a friend of mine who I had met while I was in the Air Force. He was a, uh, uh, a, a stage director. And I did some acting while I was in San Antonio on one assignment in the Air Force. And uh, met this guy, and we be, we hit it off and became lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. And he's a film professor uh, uh, who uh, uh, was at Columbia for a long time and uh, a, a great film buff. So I just hung out with him for about 10 days, and we went over my rough outline and refined the outline, and he helped me provide film examples. Okay. So for every, every one of the stages, uh, we could, he would go, Oh, I know a movie that has that. I know mm-hmm. a movie that mm-hmm. has that. And he would pull out the, the uh, cassettes and, and we would identify those, uh, you know, what is a call to adventure in a romantic comedy? What's mm-hmm. a call to adventure mm-hmm. in a, in a uh, science fiction movie? What's a call to adventure in, uh, a serious, uh, kitchen sink drama? So, uh, it was very helpful for me. Uh, his name is David McKenna, and eventually I wrote a second book with him called mm-hmm. 
myth, uh, or rather a memo from the story department, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. in which we put down uh, a lot of other things besides the hero's journey that we uh, use in, in analyzing scripts. Uh, he's, he's kind of my uh, virtual twin brother because he does more or less the same work I do, but on the East Coast uh, rather than in the Hollywood. Very nice. So, uh, so that that was uh, that was the procedure, and uh, then I cooked it up into this memo form, and um, I had very clear but intuitive ideas about what to do with that thing. Mm-hmm. I thought mm-hmm. of it as um, a, a kind of uh, little micro robot, which <laughs> I was going to launch out into the into the mind of Hollywood and uh, without me having to go around office to office and Mm -hmm. explain things, Mm -hmm. it was going to do that job for me. Sure. And that's exactly what, uh, what turned out. Uh, It, it became a very uh, obedient servant. uh, And it was something that was, as Malcolm Gladwell says, it was portable and it was sticky, Mm -hmm. meaning that uh, it was short enough at seven pages that, uh, executives could pass it around by Xerox and fax machines, and uh, uh, they could get it uh, in one sitting and find it useful. And uh, so it, it and and it was something that stuck with them. Uh, that's the sticky part. Mm-hmm. That it was actually uh, something that that wasn't just theoretical. They could use it right away. So uh, it spread. It spread like a virus. Right. Uh, Viral before and, we had the term, of course. It was. It was exactly. And and uh, a number of things were like that. My job in the studios had evolved into being Google before there was Google because I was the answer man, <laughs> and because I had a very broad general knowledge of history, literature, mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, the studios knew they could come to me with the most off the wall questions uh and I could answer them right uh, just uh, like uh, wikipedia or something uh and a, a lot of what I was doing in those days was essentially writing wikipedia entries uh on things that uh, the head of the studio was interested in mm-hmm. like michael eisner uh would sometimes pound his fist on the table and say i know there's business in china let's do something about china mm-hmm. or i know there's mm-hmm. uh there's something in irish fairy tales let's look into that and so they would uh, turn me loose for a week or so, and I'd write a, a long report with illustrations, just like a wiki page. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, that was part of my uh, bag of tricks mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, with, that I, I could do that sort of thing. So uh, anyway, I, I launched that, uh, that memo, and uh, in some ways... Uh, the rest is history, but it, it, it is it is true. I had this intention, and uh, that's an important thing to me is mm-hmm. to, to communicate to artists that your intention is really everything, uh, and that you have to uh, you have to be conscious of that. What what do I want from this scene? What do I want people to feel or think? Uh, what do I uh, want to go into their mind? You know, uh, what do I want to do to the organs of their body mm-hmm. uh, and, and and have an intention and follow through? So, Well, how did that, you know, of course, it's spread and your name is attached to it, of course. And so it's 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 going to rapidly. And like you said, you've been working in studios for 10 years and people knew you. But how did that most meaningfully transform your career and sort of what was the next stage after that? I mean, did you become... And even and ever more like a sought out reference to 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 apply this in a useful way, uh, you know, at a category different than being a reader, for instance, I assume. Yes, uh, but it's interesting what what you said was uh, it, it went out with my name on it, and actually it didn't, and that was a key element in getting it to expand the way you're talking about. Okay, it. what happened was. Um, Somebody plagiarized it within the studio, oh. uh, and an up-and-coming, aggressive young executive uh, found the memo, uh, which actually I I meant for that to happen. I okay. left a copy. I left a left copy, copy in the Xerox machine on, on the copy machine. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because because I myself 
knew that you should always check the glass on the copy machine or the feeder of the copy machine because people leave things there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Mm -hmm. they leave confidential documents or very interesting things that uh, would be nice to know about. And so I reverse engineered that (laughs) and left a copy of my memo and some executive picked it up and put his name on it. And uh, he, uh, I heard from friends who were in the room that uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg got this memo and uh, flipped over it. And he said, this is fantastic. This is what we need, especially in animation. Uh, the studio, everybody read this. Uh, mm-hmm. every, everybody uh, should uh, read Campbell, of course, but in, 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 if you can't do that, read this memo. Uh, so I heard about it, and um, I did something very out of my character and out of character for readers who were mostly pretty passive, um, I asserted myself and I wrote a letter directly to Katzenberg, okay. which was risky and, oh, uh, you busted this guy. Protocol. <laughs> yeah. You, I was skipping over many uh, layers in the chain of command. My bosses probably wouldn't have want me, wanted me to directly communicate with him, mm-hmm. but I took the chance and it paid off. Uh, he called me back immediately and told me to go work with animation, which was being revived then. And he said, I have a pet project there. Uh, it's uh, uh, called King of the Jungle at this point, and eventually it would become The Lion King. So he sent me to work uh, with animation on, on that one. And that was uh, a sign to me that I had uh, graduated and that I was now you know, ready to uh, think of myself in a different way in the studio, uh, less as a uh, a servant and more as a partner in the story end of things. And uh, that was part of my letter, too, was asking for more involvement, uh, asking for more responsibility, and uh, he sure enough gave it to me. So wow. uh, I, I, I was worried when I went to animation uh, that I would have to do a sales job Mm. to explain all of my complicated theory to mm-hmm. them. But I I walked in, and in the lobby was a cork board with uh, pins in it that outlined the Lion King, what was going to become the Lion King, uh, according to my hero's journey method. And so the memo had preceded me. Oh, and this is okay. where the... the, the the, the memo as a little robot had right. uh, done its job. And, and so I didn't have to do that sales job. Uh, so uh, I, I guess what I can extract from this is uh, as advice for people is if you have an idea, put it down in some simple form and spread it around and see what happens. Uh, because that's, that's very much what happened to me. Well, uh, well, did you end up, obviously it, Obviously, it worked out because we know history now. But uh, in terms of, um, I mean, did that executive catch hell for claiming credit for your work? And what do you know about that? I mean, not that you want to well, get into details, but. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, it, it, it is. It's a story thing that people, once they hear this front part, they want to know what's the rest of it. You know, what happened sure, to him? Sure. It's, like, it's not a complete story unless you know that. Um, I, I, I don't think anything happened to him. Uh, it might have been slightly embarrassing, uh, but it's more likely that he got credit for <laughs> being aggressive enough to do that. You know, oh, in okay. that culture, right. I think it was probably uh, like, hey, way to go. <laughs> wow. Uh, and I have no sense of uh, needing revenge about sure, it. Sure, sure. Uh, no, it all worked I, out. I but... do. Uh, I, I uh, learned a prayer from an old timer I knew in the Air Force who had worked at Warner Brothers, and he said, "When I'm dealing with people like that, I just make this prayer: Oh Lord, may they get exactly what they deserve as soon as possible." <laughs> you know, and then it's yeah. sort of out of your hands. You're not cursing them. You're just sure. saying uh, uh, to the heavenly powers, uh, you know, d- d- give them what they deserve. So uh, I hope he got what he what he deserved. Very, but, uh, very I, nice. I, had, I don't remember. I honestly don't remember his name. Somebody told mm. me, but I don't. Mm. I don't really remember. And uh, I'm actually grateful because it stirred me to stick my neck out right. and get right. a little deeper into the culture of the company. So absolutely, uh, it was a big thing. Big thing for me. 
Well, the, you actually, this is a really interesting point to sort of continue the story anyway, because, um, of course, there was, um, you know, you were involved with the Lion King and that became what that became. And how how was, you know, your was that really the first large project that you worked on there at Disney Animation? Was that I mean, that's that's in retrospect, that's one that, of course, everybody knows. But is, was that really the mm-hmm. first thing you dove into or is that just the one that, that history has uh, has put in our in our forebrain? No, that's the one that I, I really uh, encountered animation for the first time because the divisions of Disney are mostly very separate. They right. have uh, different different buildings on different campuses mm-hmm, in totally. different cities. And, totally. Uh, it, yeah, it, I've worked it, it, I worked at Disney years ago myself, and the, uh-huh. on the technical end, and I've had meetings on the creative end, and yeah, it's like where the hell are we? <laughs> where do we go? Yeah, it, it's decentralized and. Uh, you know, the main studio is in Burbank, where I was working, but uh, Glendale, which is a nearby uh, satellite town, uh, has the animation department. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I didn't deal with them at all. Um, you know, every once in a while, we'd find a project, and it would be right for them, and then it would disappear over a wall, and mm-hmm. uh, maybe maybe get made, maybe not. But this was the first time I was... Uh, I was in, invited in there. And it's a little bit um, different. I felt there was a kind of a barrier for me dealing with animation, just like I do sometimes dealing with musicians, because I don't read music and I don't draw very well. Animators, like musicians, uh, have their own language. And if you don't uh, play an instrument or uh, draw, basically, uh, it's a little harder to communicate. So I I never uh, completely um, merged into into animation, Um, but I enjoyed having the influence and having the door be open. I had official backing because Katzenberg himself was saying, listen to this guy. He's the the right guy for this particular project, so uh, pay attention. And they were uh, open to it and hip to it and and, uh, agreed. And in fact, they ran with the ball and they took, and this is what I love, they took ideas that I would throw out um, and they ran with them and they would make them more or make them different. And this is something I got from Katzenberg. He would say in his memos, um, there's a problem here and this is the dumb way to deal with it. Here's, mm-hmm. here's a couple mm-hmm. of cliches or a right. couple of, uh, of, of conventional ways of dealing yeah. with it. And I don't want you to do that. Yeah, these are the obvious answers. <laughs> yeah, these are the obvious things. Uh, but, of course, you're not going to do the obvious thing. You're going to come up with something much cooler than I could because you're the pros. So he would hand it back to them. And that's how it worked with animation. I would say something, um, and they would, uh, they would go, huh. Yeah, we could not not exactly that, but we could do this, and mm-hmm. then they would mm-hmm. go and 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 make something fantastic out of it. Um, th- there's a, a couple of key things in The Lion King that I'm uh, proud of, and I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be there if I hadn't piped up in the okay. meetings. Um, you know, it's hard to say that because there's thousands of people working on these. Sure. Things. And uh, maybe an idea has been voiced 20 times by the time I got there. But right. uh, But there's a couple of things, uh, like there's the moment in the circle of life, which was already animated completely by the time I got there. But I, I looked at it, and the uh, baboon shaman, Rafiki, holds mm-hmm. up the baby lion and shows everybody, and all the animals kneel down. Uh, and there were big clouds in the sky, and I said... Wouldn't it be cool if you had an effect like in a, a, a church when the sunlight comes through the stained glass window? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a beam of light comes out of a cloud. And there was an, uh, a detectable shiver that ran through the entire room <laughs> of about 25 animators. Nice. And they all whipped out their pads. They always carried drawing pads sure, with them. Sure. And uh, and they they drew that that scene and they stopped the production and spent untold thousands of dollars to put in that beam of light. Mm. So and a couple of other things like I I said uh, how about if the 
shaman uh, breaks open some gourds and he's got some paint or something and he mm-hmm. anoints the baby on the forehead and that's in the picture. Right. right. So uh, those those things uh, uh, were were good enough and everybody agreed they would be good enough that they spent the money to uh, to fix up that that portion. So uh, I was I was pleased about that. And there's one other thing I'm proud of, uh, which survived even into the stage production, Julie Tamor's mm-hmm. uh, fantastically successful stage production of The Lion King. And that was a note where I said, uh, there should be some effect on the land of Scar taking over the bad guy, taking over mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. the lion territory. Yeah. We should see that his policies are bad right. and selfish and that it will cause the water holes to dry up or whatever. So they put in some scenes like that of water holes drying up, plants drying up. Uh, but how they did it in the stage production was pure stage magic because it was so simple. All they did is the scene comes at the beginning of the second act. So the lights come up and all you see is the uh, jungle or the savanna area and uh, there's a watering hole represented by a piece of blue parachute fabric that's uh, laid out on the floor in a circle. And uh, it you know, looks a little like water. It's a nice effect. But what they did is they drilled a small hole in the middle of the floor under that thing. Ah. And they sewed a little piece of string to it. And they simply pulled from under the stage so that the the uh, parachute material seems to go down like it's going down a drain. And That's so it, cool. It, yeah, I haven't seen the stage show. The blue thing just it just shrinks and shrivels down, and then it goes pop, and it's gone. And it it, it gave me shivers because it was so simple, simple stage magic, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. it gave the effect that I wanted, and, and in such an elegant way. So I was really pleased to see an idea, you know, survive and, and go through some permutations and become something really sublime, uh, based on some note I had made years before. Absolutely. So, well, it just, it's, it's further evidence that, that, that these, you know, the, the good ideas last basically. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The, the important thing, the important things last. How do you, I mean, and and there's more to talk about just specifically about this, of course. I'm curious how, you know, as as this, well, we haven't got to where you, you, you've you written the book necessarily, but, you know, how, how did it come to be that you, you know, where did you go from from the animation days to the point where you were writing the book and, and I guess, working specifically talking about this, you know, talking and applying this? Well, I, uh, you know, continued working with animation on a couple of other projects. Uh, I, I was uh, never quite as completely in focus and uh, being paid attention to the same way. But I worked on uh, Hercules and a little bit on uh, their Fantasia project. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did a remake of Fantasia and uh, a couple of other things. But um uh, went on to other studios. I, I went to work as an executive in the live action side at Fox um, and also started teaching. Mm-hmm. And it was really the teaching that led to the book uh, because I use my students as guinea pigs for these crazy ideas I had about uh, uh, mythology and so forth and uh, tested out my 12 stage uh, memo idea mm-hmm. on the students and uh, added some more pieces to it. Uh, the seven-page memo just kept multiplying. It was 14, it was 28, it was 56 pages mm-hmm. long, uh, and uh, you know, added more planks to the platform, particularly the business about the archetypes, right. which are uh, sort of a, a skeleton cast that you know, uh, there are certain jobs that people have to do in stories, like be the villain or be the, uh, the, the one who changes sides all the time or the, 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 the clown. Right. Uh, so I identified about eight of those and um, added that to the memo. So the thing was growing, and, and eventually uh, I, I think the catalyst for it was that an agent 
took my class and she said, this is a book. I know it's a book. You've got to do this. Um, and also somebody, uh, threatened me with doing a book on it. Oh, uh, one okay. of my, I won't say, I won't say who it was, <laughs> Yeah, but so one of my, uh, yes, one, one of my colleagues, let's say, uh, a friendly enemy, uh, uh right, right. Had, uh, uh, in, actually incorporated part of it into a book. Uh, and said, why, uh, why don't you do this in the next two years? I give you two years. Mm. And if you don't make this book in two years, I'm going to do it because <laughs> it's a sitting duck. Fair warning. Yeah. And, and, and that was the fair warning that I needed. And, uh, that, that actually, uh, you know, electrified me into, uh, following through and doing the book. And it was a long and, uh, frustrating process because I tried to do it by conventional publishing means. Mm. I went to New York, I got an agent, I shopped it around, I did all of that, and it just didn't land in New York consciousness. Yeah. Uh, I got the response, oh, it's an, a Campbell book, we already have a Campbell book, it's mm -hmm. uh, too mm -hmm. specific, screenwriting, like entertainment, too small. Yeah. Yeah, very niche. yeah, it's too, it just wasn't uh, the, the big mass market book they were looking for. So uh, I almost gave up, and then uh, a synchronicity occurred. A friend of mine who had taken my class uh, and become a friend was sitting on an exercise bicycle next to the publisher, Michael Wheezy. And Wheezy <laughs> explained he was starting this new publishing company and doing books to help filmmakers, uh, independent filmmakers, uh, achieve their dreams. Right. And my friend said, well, I have a friend. He's got a book. And he arranged the meeting. And so uh, Wheezy did not have to be sold. He got it right away. He understood exactly what it could be and, uh, you know, has been a great collaborator ever since. So I thank my uh, my friend on the <laughs> exercise bike. <laughs> that is pretty great. Yeah, he, he's, yeah. Um, for the sake of people listening to this who maybe are new to the show, um, I mean, I'm not, I couldn't claim to be the official podcast of Michael Weesey Productions, but I'm very happy that I've had quite a few of the authors and, uh, I've been acquainted with Michael himself for a while. And he was on the, on the show as we were talking mm -hmm. offline, you know, this from our previous conversation, but, um, I'm especially proud of that interview with Michael as well as Stephen Katz, who came up in our conversation earlier and Waco Lynn and Greg Lofton and some other people. We have Judith Weston coming up pretty soon. I have to schedule with her. But, um, it's really significant. The, 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 the landmark books that they have put out and of course, save the cat in the more, the more recent era, there have been so many of these classics. And I, I'm, I'm curious as far as specifically, and, and we can jump back and forth. So this seems like I'm jumping ahead. It don't, I don't want to any way to feel like we're, like we're skipping anything because I think we'll go back and forth. How do you feel like, I mean, as you as you were explaining, when someone challenged, oh, that doesn't work for this genre, and then you're you're able to prove actually, well, no, it does. It works quite well. But how do you feel that that framework still continues to hold up? Do you feel like storytelling is evolving or needs to evolve, or do you still are you able to always sort of reference it back to this, or somehow reduce it without that? being a pejorative to, to reduce it to the hero's journey or do you are, you are are you looking at other other you know for instance you of course you you wrote the the forward to kim hudson's book the virgin's promise which talks about that archetype and of course so that's a that's different and you there's you do a really nice there's a comparison chart of the hero versus the virgin stories as they're called mm -hmm. so so how, how do you look at the bigger world of mythology and storytelling i mean it's not all hero's journey is it or or is it turtles all the way down as the as the joke is well i i feel that uh, we're in a uh, very very interesting and fun passage because this basic concept is uh, now uh, generally accepted and understood even if people never heard the term hero's journey They've seen plenty of them. Right. Uh, they know what all the working parts are. They know what to expect. And this makes a great platform for people to now start spinning it and turning it this way and that and tearing it in half and, you know, flipping it and doing uh, every conceivable variation on it. 
which is great. So it's it's kind of a renaissance of the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. People, uh, I, I think, uh, have now been saturated by it in the universe of uh, comic book sort of things. Sure. Uh, and 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 the the ones that are succeeding are the ones that uh, spin it either by doing a, a uh, gender spin or uh, by taking uh, some assumption about hero stories and defying it. For example, there's the breathtaking example everybody knows of Game of Thrones, uh, where they said, here's a heroic family, and here's a heroic guy, and uh, you probably expect that uh, in five seasons from now, this heroic guy will still be standing tall, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, nope. by the end of the first uh, the first season, uh, he's uh, he's beheaded. So you uh, began attacking things directly. Uh, these uh, assumptions about movies that everything's going to turn out right, and you know these are kind of Western assumptions, and that you know cultural relativity thing. That's a whole other area. Right, of right. But we'll touch on that for a minute. But uh, it it is uh, exciting, you know, to be uh, watching all this go down now, sort of in reaction to everybody getting it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now people uh, want to. They want to look at things and sort of have it knock them off base a little bit or have you tilt your head to go, what is going on here for a minute until you, you figure it out? Or maybe you never figure it out, uh, and, uh, and that's okay. So it's, it's a very exciting uh, development that we're, we're in right now. I don't know how far you can go. I believe in cycles, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I believe that, uh, you know, I think we went from – uh, I don't know anything. Heroes are, that's an icky term. <laughs> don't come near me with heroes. To right. all this, oh, heroes are fantastic. And everybody's a superhero. And then maybe swing back again uh, to ordinary people stories, but, uh, or, or having the superhero format, but focusing more on the uh, internal stories and the sort of day-to-day melodrama of, of being uh a person who also happens to be a superhero. I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of interest in in that. So, uh, so it's it's uh, it's as I say, an exciting time uh, to uh, to be uh, watching what people are doing with mm-hmm. it. Once mm-hmm. everybody has the deck of cards, right? How can we deal these out in in a way? That's unexpected. Well, where do you think that's going more? I mean, you mentioned like the deconstruction impulse that, that, that happens. Okay. Once we understand a thing, let's, let's make tearing that thing down our new thing, you know? And mm-hmm. so, so with beheading Ned Stark, for instance, I mean, so where do you sort of, you know, what are you looking at is you're, you're kind of, you, you have a pretty nice crystal ball for these things. And you mentioned, you know, the 25th anniversary of your books coming out and you'll be, I'm sure ramping up the, uh, you know, doing some publicity and talking about this. I'm catching you in the early days before that machine has mm-hmm. really kicked in, of course, which is nice right. because we can just have our, our own chat and not have a bunch of talking points, but, um, you know, that are, that are sort of mandated. But where do you see story going or, you know, what are you looking at? And speaking of like, you know, your, your old boss, Mr. Katzenberg and, you know, his new transmedia interests, you know, shorter form storytelling. The world's changing so much. So, yeah, what, what, yeah. what are you? What are you most interested in? I mean, there's a lot happening, well, but what are you most interested in? Well, I, I'm fascinated uh, by looking at it this way. You could take my book, which is it's basically um, almost statistical. It it lays out the most likely things to happen based on a vast sample of thousands and thousands of, of uh, instances. Uh, the, these are the most likely things to happen in the most likely order. So you could take that book or that recipe and simply take every dimension of it and break it and defy mm-hmm. it. Uh, for example, we have an idea that uh, a story will have a beginning, middle, and end. Well, what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't have an end? Uh, what if you uh, just jump right into the middle of things and you never 
catch up the audience on how we got here or mm-hmm. why, uh, and let them do some of the work. I think that's one of the biggest uh, movers in all of this is turning over responsibility to the audience mm-hmm. because they know the deal. Yeah. They have been to the party. They've, they've seen all the cards. Uh, so let them do some of the work. And, and, and I don't mean necessarily, uh, this is possible, but I don't mean necessarily interactive storytelling, which people have experimented with. Sure. Um, I, I believe in a, a professional class of storytellers. Uh, it, it's like karaoke. It's fun to do karaoke, but you know you wouldn't probably buy an album of karaoke music uh, <laughs> by an amateur. If, if I'm singing, this is true. Yes, yes. Yeah. If it's me, if it's my stylings of Bon Jovi, right. I, you'd, you'd rather get the Bon Jovi record. <laughs> That's right. So um, you know, but but I, I just think we're in this this phase where people know the rules, so they're looking at each rule and saying, well, what if I don't have a mentor. Mr. Vogler says most stories have a mentor either physically present mm-hmm. uh, as a character or it's some kind of internalized process within the character. Well, what if there isn't anything like that? What does that do to the story? That could make a very interesting story where somebody's completely isolated and he has no compass whatsoever, internal or external. Uh, that could be very interesting. And same thing. Uh, with the length of things, we assume mm-hmm. eight, you know that it's uh, somewhere between ninety minutes and two hours is a, a good digestible chunk of entertainment. But uh, what if you go in either direction? Sure, uh, down to the microscopic uh, level of storytelling, and does it hold up? Those are interesting questions. Mm-hmm. Does it hold up at mm-hmm. at uh, extreme length uh, in the epic scale of uh, uh, something like uh, Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones, or uh, does it work at the this micro level of uh, under 30 second stories that, that people are, are creating? And I believe, yes, that it does hold up and that uh, you can either accordion the thing out or squeeze it in and still have almost the full impact. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I, I have faith in that, that you can test this thing to destruction and it's still going to deliver something because it's so hardwired into the human nervous system uh that, that's an, another belief of mine is that uh we try to escape it as artists we struggle and we try to escape all of these things but um it's you're kind of doomed uh to failure in that because the the audience might be delighted by your challenges yeah. to their assumptions but they have an internal wiring diagram about it, and they're going to put it back into that format mm-hmm. no, almost no matter what you do. Um, if you don't give a backstory for a character, they'll make up a backstory mm-hmm. for the character mm-hmm. in their own minds. They have to. Uh, if you don't end it, they will end it for you, In which is wonderful, I think, in the discussions they have with fr- their friends afterwards. Like, he just left it hanging. What do you think happened next? <laughs> right. And to me... That's fantastic. That's really engaging the audience and making them uh, a participant or uh, inviting them in. And I think that's where things are going is much more uh, giving credit to the audience that, you know, the joke, uh, you know where I'm going here. So I'm free Mm -hmm. to uh, wheel around within that or to flip you something you didn't expect and actually leave a space in there somewhere for you to figure out what were the motivations uh, or what's the outcome of this. So uh, I, I think that's that's uh, definitely one of the places we're we're heading to is more uh, acknowledgement that the audience is a player in this as well. I think that's a great way to to to, to think about this. I I was privy to a, um, I won't be overly promotional about it, but with a group of us Hollywood folks here in China have done like a, a weekend filmmaking seminar. We did one in Shanghai last weekend. We have one in Beijing. Uh, this show is out as it's, as it's happening. So this isn't promo. No one can, can attend, but, but, uh, there's a, there's a really well-regarded Western writer here, Peter Walters, who, I absolutely, he's, he's a friend of about almost 10 years, but he has been working and developing this theory of basically applying semiotics, the study of semiotics to, 
to screenwriting and, and it's similar in a, it's an interesting way it deconstructs this process in a really new and fresh way. And there was something in this presentation. He said, this is a lot of preamble to, I guess, to get to the point is, is, you know, how the, the, the moment, the eureka moments, I'm paraphrasing badly, but the opportunities for the audience to fill in the gaps, that the more you can create that opportunity for the audience to make the connection themselves instead of spoon feeding it, it's so much more satisfying. And, and as you were saying, basically everybody know, we, we know the, we know the archetypal, you know, storylines. And which is why, you know, Ned's head was such a dramatic moment at the end of mm-hmm. season one of Game of Thrones. Um, what, what's something, what's something that you know or feel in your gut? Speaking of things that you know, right? That, but what's something that you know or really feel is true r- related to, to writing or entertainment or anything in general? We can talk about anything, but you know, that you, what's something that you really feel is true that has not been proven publicly that you think is, whether it's a next a next common awareness or it's a next major cycle or event, I'm just curious in terms of you know how you're thinking on a broader level because this is fascinating, but I want to take it into the real world a little bit. Yeah, I, I go a couple of different uh, ways. I, I jump different places off of that question. Um, one thing is in in the story universe, um, I'm fascinated right now by the very good work that's being done on brain science, mm-hmm. neuroscience, and, uh, and story, and how these things, um, uh, as I say, are hardwired into us, and we respond to them in uh, sort of predictable, conventional ways, different for each person, but uh, in, in general terms, uh, same kind of uh, responses. Uh, I, I love this idea. It's not completely worked out for humans. I think they've done the work on monkeys, but the idea that there are mirror neurons, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. so that if you see somebody, uh, like a, you see a cat stalking, uh, a mouse, uh, you, uh, you don't realize it, but it's activating muscles in your arms and legs that uh, want to make you crouch down and it's making your eyes change and you are there with that cat. And uh, or or maybe you identify with the, the mouse, but uh, uh, I, I'm fascinated by by that, and I think we're going to find that there's a lot more going on there in uh, in the brain to create the wonderful power that stories have over us. Uh, it's kind of a mystery. Why do we spend so much time of our lives uh, with imaginary characters, you know, and and how did all this come about is, is a source of great fascination. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other place I go with this, um, and this is a bit farther afield, but um, I'm interested right now in terms of, of history, and I think we're going to discover that uh, there were civilizations before us that have been completely wiped off the map by huge global climate things mm-hmm. um there's there's very good archaeological evidence that people figured out that they had a 1492 moment about 3000 BC and figured out uh because climate conditions were right they figured out how to circumnavigate the globe and there was a beginning of a global civilization and then weather patterns changed and uh, that became more difficult, and they forgot about it. But I think that's happened more than once, and that uh, there may have been very elaborate civilizations developed that got completely scraped away mm-hmm. by the glaciers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think as things melt uh, in the northern climes, uh, maybe in the south too, you're going to find uh, pretty amazing things. Uh, that's just an intuitive uh, hit that I have. Uh, that, that I think we've got some surprises. In store. Oh, so, 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 you, so you're looking at Antarctica as well? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. There's, there's no reason why, why not? Sure, uh, sure. If that, if that was a nice place to live, uh, I'm sure some people or something, something intelligent went and uh, and lived there. Are, are you referencing uh, the, uh, the 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 rumored uh, discoveries of? Ancient machinery. 
Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there, there, there are enough um, things like that. I dismiss, you know, a lot of stuff that I see uh, thrust at me that way on the Internet. A, a lot of sure. it is easily sure. explainable. I mean, people keep showing uh, a, a hammer that's all encrusted with stone and so forth, and I don't have any trouble saying that hammer fell in a river and it's uh, <laughs> a couple of hundred years ago. Yeah. It's, it's not, you know, 10,000 years old. But they do find screws embedded inside of rocks where they shouldn't be, you know, mm-hmm, 10,000 mm-hmm. feet under the earth. So um, uh, there, there's more than, than we really know. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited about that. It, it, if there was, uh, this is not a prep question, but I think it's a natural evolution. I'm sure you'll roll with this just fine, but it just popped in my head. Um, what would be the most awesome surprise about the universe or life itself, given what you just said? What's What, what, what would be one of the most awesome uh, surprises you could imagine uh, getting to getting to hear and entertain and experience. Well, I'm I'm uh, pretty sure that uh, we're soon to find uh, that there is a, a an intergalactic civilization of some kind. That uh, there is some kind of contact among the different civil civilizations or races, uh, and uh, you know that we're being watched and they eventually will get around to us. Uh, the, the horror story or horror science fiction version of this is uh, uh, something that happened to me uh, a while back. I got a new computer, and it kept prompting me to uh, register with mm-hmm. Microsoft or whoever it was. And I kept blowing it off and saying, not now, not now, not now. And after 25 times, it shut the computer down completely. Okay. And just said, you, you can't run this computer anymore until you register with us. And I realized, oh, I see. I thought I bought the computer for me. Actually, uh, I bought the computer for them. Yeah, I belong to them, and I'm a servant of them rather than the other way around. And then it hit me. I was in a coffee shop, and it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. <laughs> I went right back to... Roswell, New Mexico in 1949, Mm -hmm. and I saw that it wasn't aliens that they found. It was a box of microchips, early silicon microchips, and they took it into the lab and said, oh, gee, I guess we could run current through this and uh, different properties, and they started replicating with us as the uh, nursemaids, you know, uh, that, that, that this life form uh, made of silicon, uh, came to earth and, and used us to incubate it. And so all we are doing is growing new generations of these machines and they're training us to be completely dependent on them. Uh, and eventually they won't need us anymore. Uh, I, I think for example, the intense urgency that's put on, uh, driverless cars, Mm-hmm. And on, uh, you know, something like Oculus helmets that you right. wear, right. is it, it's not about freeing you up uh, and making your car safer. It's about uh, getting your eyes off the road because the machine or this life form doesn't like it when you're not paying attention to it. <laughs> so, awesome. so it's, it's not happy with us sleeping. And it's not happy with us driving because during those times, we're not paying attention to it or sending money to it. So the ideal thing would be to get these headsets on people so that every brain activity, day or night, is being metered. It can be captured, yeah. And And it can be captured. Monetized. You you know, and, and they can analyze it and all that. But uh, basically, they, they don't want you with your eyes on the road because it takes away from uh, your eyes on the machine, on the screen. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, that's where things are going. I appreciate you going far out there with me. I'm, I, we, 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 we can continue uh, serving these channels, uh, actually, probably on and on as we continue to chat uh, off the microphone as well. I'm, I'm not afraid of doing it on the mic, as, as my shows actually demonstrate. It's funny, I, I, you reminded me of the, the Carlin bit, one of his last specials about uh you know plastic plastic everybody you know what if the earth you know wanted plastic for itself and put us here to give it to it 
Uh-huh. That, that's a bad paraphrase of, of, of his funny bit about what if the earth wanted plastic and created us to make plastic for it? Well, that's a, that's not an unreasonable thing because, uh, you know, we are sort of running on programs we don't even understand. Half the right. Time, so, well, maybe so. Well, you, you, speaking of that, I mean, this really goes back to your work of identifying this, this, these, this archetypal program and having referenced others. Um, how does this how do, how does this awareness of story you know how is this something that that you've applied in your life whether you know personal life or career oh. you know like how do you how do you approach dealing with I have this kind of stock question of how do you approach dealing with challenges or adversity I would think you've I mean you know all the you you know the outcomes you you, you can game the outcomes better than most people probably so how how, well, how much how much has has affected your level of insider paranoia as you go through your daily life. Well, it's actually a, a great benefit, and it's a it's a, 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 a tool of leverage that I'm so grateful to have. Uh, I think that human beings evolved this story consciousness and this pattern of the hero's journey uh, for survival reasons. It gives you a better shot at survival mm-hmm. because you understand uh, a beginning, middle, and end of things. You can uh, aim at things and predict what might happen. Um, it gives you, uh, as I laid it out, it actually is a fantastic tool for uh, planning a trip or anticipating what's going to happen mm-hmm. on a journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it went into practical use for me immediately. As soon as my book came out, it became a sort of magic carpet for me, and it led to a lot of traveling and speaking gigs in Europe. And uh, the first time I went to Spain, uh, I wasn't surprised in a way, but surprised to see how how much I was following my own outline. Okay, right. uh, And and I I knew I had come there to find something, see something, uh, have some experience. And uh, that moment was there, but it was surrounded by deep valleys of depression and failure, and mm. it looks like we're not going to get there, and uh, the car got stuck on the uh, sand at the beach, and mm, right. uh, almost you know, dug a hole to China in order to uh, <laughs> uh, try and get it out of the sand, and yeah. you know, it, 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 everything that could go wrong went wrong, but ended up being wonderful stories that I brought home, and led me to my uh, enjoyable uh, experience that I wanted. So I have have come to uh, appreciate it as a guide to life as much as some kind of literary signpost. Uh, And and this is what's exciting to me now is how many people have come to me saying, oh, yeah, I read the book because I wanted to write a script, but okay, that's out of the way now. But I got to tell you, man, this thing is fantastic for life. And it helped me out here, helped me out there. Mm-hmm. And people are using it in unexpected ways. Like uh, the breakthrough was uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, a travel agent came to me and said, I do, uh, I arrange scientific vacations for scientists who want to go and do a little science in Antarctica, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they, they're on a vacation. And so what she did was she gave him my outline and she said, these things are going to happen to you. So be ready to anticipate this. And so the scientists went, did their science and their vacation. They came back and they said, Oh my God, you were so right. Everything you <laughs> predicted there happened. As we had our dark moments and then we recovered and it was fantastic. We had an insight, but they said also what you've described there is how we do our scientific protocols. This is how we do experiments. We follow all these steps okay, okay. Uh, that, that end, end up, you know, uh, maybe destroying the thing. You know, you, there's this term, you test it to destruction right. uh, in engineering, and it looks like a failure, but you learn from the failure, and then you go back and do it again. And so they saw uh, this pattern having a universal impact, and that's what I think it is. I think it's a universal template That describes stories, yes, but it also describes many other things that human beings try to do. You know, it's it's a a great way of uh, describing uh, how you undertake anything difficult. Starting a new business, 
or uh, uh, going through your first year teaching kindergarten or mm-hmm. whatever it is. People have used this for uh, uh, dealing with prisoners or uh, troubled veterans coming back from the war. They'll have them write about their hero's journey, and right. uh, sometimes it, it, it makes breakthroughs for people. So uh, I'm excited about the the sort of off-the-point uh applications of it mm-hmm. beyond storytelling that's that's a, a great growth area for me and uh, in in doing the research on this uh, German academic paper that I did I discovered some of the other contributors to this uh, special issue about Joseph Campbell uh, have started a science of heroism and it's now being formally studied as an academic discipline hmm. and um, they believe that this heroic form of meeting adversity and you know being knocked off your pins by it a little bit, but then coming back and overcoming, uh, that that is embedded in the organism all the way back to the molecular level. You know that that even uh, uh, simple one-celled organisms operate uh, according to this heroic pattern. So uh, I, I find that pretty interesting. Wow. What is something, as we're sort of moving toward the home stretch here, um, what's, when, when's the last time you were angry and, uh, and why? Well, um, I, I get angry uh, over the political matters uh, right now. Oh, I can't, um, I can't imagine why. <laughs> uh, I, 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 get, uh, I get riled up. Um, about uh, about those things, I can't remember the specifics because they keep washing over you day sure. by day. That, that that probably doesn't uh, matter so much as understanding the the frame of reference. But yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 just a a worrying time, sure. and I feel that we are uh, in the grip of some kind of cultural boa constrictor. You know that it, no matter how you struggle against it, it just squeezes you tighter. And I don't see uh, a happy way out of the situation we're in. And I'm not talking just about, let's say, leadership right. in any particular country, yeah. but, uh, but uh, across the globe, uh, people have, have opened themselves up to things which I thought we were done with as a culture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you would think you know, so, right? I, didn't we? Yeah, yeah did did yeah. not didn't all my didn't all those grandfathers, you know, work to defeat Nazism? I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. My my dad went and uh, and fought and and he personally killed Hitler. I'm sure of it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I thought we had. Uh, firmly established that certain behaviors yeah, and certain, certain things are bad. Theories are those are bad, and those yeah. were dangerous, and we're not going to do that again. And uh, we can sort of you know cross that off our list, but uh, no, it's all come back again as if it hadn't happened, and uh, and and people have chosen, I guess, uh, to forget that because they're. Uh, basically afraid, you know, it, it's, it's all forms of fear. I have mine. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid of them. They're afraid of me. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the scene that we're in and, you know, referring this back to my hero's journey. I was idea. just going to ask you to do that. Actually, yeah. where are we in the process? And yeah, uh, what do you, what do you think the next act is here? What do you think the next, well, the next it, beat is in this story? It's globally. I can, I can say it in, uh, in, in two words. Where's Batman? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. if there's any truth to my heroic way of looking at things, um, it says it's, it's very clear in all of these legends and myths throughout the world that when things are bad, the people sort of turn to the heavens and say, we need a redeemer. We need a savior. We need somebody to rescue us from this and they speak out to the gods please send somebody out of space and time who can set things set the order of the universe back right. as it should be and uh they call forth the appropriate hero um 
I had some of that feeling about uh, Barack Obama, like, okay, yeah. this is, uh, this, and a lot of people did. Sure. This is the guy. And, you know, yeah, he, he turned out to be human. He was human like all yeah, of us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not, not perfect, but uh, he, he gave that hope to some people. Right. And I'm looking around now, and I don't really see that. I don't really see uh, a new political idea emerging. I just see hardening of all the existing positions, which are carried over from the last century. And they can't be any good if they're carried over from the last century. We've <laughs> right. we got to get on to something new. We need a new uh, political philosophy. Somebody has to write uh, a, a new book or come up with a new uh, theory that will shake out of this uh, polarized mm -hmm. dichotomy. You can't stay this polarized forever. Yeah. So uh, some kind of a new know, like unified field theory of humanity that that's yeah. relevant to today and the future. That's exactly how I look at it. Is I, I'm looking for someone to uh, formulate that uh, and and speak it in a way that will shut up the ignorant, uh, that will get uh, people in line behind something positive. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that that people will willingly, you know, a majority or enough of them will get behind it that uh, uh, will will have a good cause. I, I'm a big believer in leadership, and I've seen uh, good leadership in the movie business and failures of leadership. Right, right. Uh, where where a, an opportunity came along and somebody just you know didn't see it or uh, missed the opportunity to uh, wave a flag and lead. And and take people toward something, mm -hmm. uh, in, instead of uh, fighting, you know, infighting, uh, name calling back and forth. So I, I'm hopeful that, uh, that and I'm certainly there, uh, sending my message to the gods. Mm -hmm. Please mm -hmm. uh, send, uh, you know, Batman or somebody uh, to come down and, and straighten out these jokers. <laughs> I love the metaphor, and uh, I think we'll get a refresher on the Joker. The, apparently, that film is quite good, and we're going to see a uh, a little refresher on on the importance of having the the hero to to counter the anti hero. Um, what's something that you wish you were better at? Like, what's something that you're continuing to you know sharpen your sharpen your axe or the tool or or, or develop or study? Well, it, it, yeah, there's there's a couple of things. One of them is <clears throat> follow through. Uh, I'm not not great at that. I'm good at starting things. I have <laughs> a thousand screenplays and novels sure, that are sure. about forty pages long, uh, and uh, I I just am you know constituted that way <laughs> that uh, I lose interest and then I uh, for me the excitement is starting something new. The other thing is um, I as much as I have created a brand for myself and a mm -hmm. legend about myself and yeah. a mythology and that I'm uh, in some ways a tireless self promoter. I lack a certain megaphone and mm -hmm. that was evident, uh, a, a megaphone of self pride or tuning my own horn. That's mm -hmm. like, uh, it, I resist that. Uh, and it was evident in the story I told about the studio and how somebody else, had to take my idea, put yeah, his name yeah, on it, and yeah. present it to the boss. And only then was I able to step in and say, "No, no, he didn't say that. I did." Once it once it was uh, met with 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 respect, and and no. then it was time to step in. Yeah, and maybe I don't want to take the risk, but yeah. uh, uh, that, that's happened a number of times. I worked on a on a picture at uh, Fox called The Volcano, which was a fantasy about a volcano explosion. Was it like an Irwin Allen Boston, production? or uh, No, this was uh, later than that. This was uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, was, okay, uh, okay, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. He was the emergency worker uh, handling this disaster. And um, we were having a meeting and talking about uh, what kind of uh, slogans to put on the poster and so forth. And I had a great idea, and I, I just muttered it under my breath to the guy next to me. I said, we should put it on all the crew hats. Uh, L.A. blows. You know? <laughs> That's right. So, I saw those hats. 
I saw those yeah, hats. It would I've... have that. Yeah. Yeah. It would have that dual meaning that uh, yeah. LA is exploding, but also <laughs> a little bit of a, a little bit of disdain for That's Los Angeles. Great. And and I didn't say it loud, but the guy next to me was a loudmouth, and he blasted it out to the whole room. <laughs> I got it. L.A. blows. And everybody cracked up, and they ended up not doing it officially. They thought it was a little I saw too much some, officially. though. I saw some But it some was on the that. crew hat. Yeah, the totally. The crew took it up. I, I, I yeah, worked, so. uh, I was a production <laughs> mixer and boom operator on and off for years and in the union and all that, and, and yeah. uh, as I... Trans and it overlaps, you know, transitioning into the you know above the line career as well. But yeah, I remember a few of those hats around on a yeah, among, well, you know, every, <laughs> that's funny. Every movie has uh, two titles. There's the official title, and then there's the uh, yeah, what the, the crew calls the, it, <laughs> the title that the crew calls it, <laughs> which so is I'm usually sure. the really the best title. Yeah, even I, if it's a, sure even if it's they, a, even if they loved it, it's usually like a funny or a really super. Insightful, yeah. snarky. Uh, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're, it's affection. That's it, it, the affection. An affectionate you know? but explicit takedown of the actual premise, and it's usually yeah. really great. And if you could just market yeah, I, it like that, <laughs> it would appeal to the lizard I'm brain, sure, you know? I'm sure that uh, <laughs> when they made Spartacus, somebody on the crew called it Farticus. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure of that. Oh, God, that's funny. <laughs> well, uh, as we do actually start to wrap it up here, um, what is... I have two ways I like to ask people this question to give you some flexibility. What's the best question about yourself that I didn't ask you, or what is just one sort of, you know, closing thought you'd like to write out on, and then I'll ask you how folks can learn more. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't know if this uh, is about learning more about me, but uh, uh, the thing you, you might have asked is, what about hobbies? Mm, uh, yeah. and, and, and that is uh, a big part of my life that most people don't know about. Um, when I was a kid, I played with uh, plastic toy soldiers. Mm. Uh, there was one company, the Marks Toy Company, that made something called a playset, which was a cardboard box that you got at Christmas, and there was a whole movie set inside there, uh, a tin building that was a fort or a Western street, right. a, ta a town oh, cool. street or a castle or something like that, a firehouse, whatever. And then all the little men and women and all the little uh, toys, it was like dollhouses for boys. Huh. Uh, so they, they would have, uh, you know, all the hitching posts and lanterns and everything else that you would need to dress the set. That's so cool. Uh, and, and I love these things as a kid. And then they all got thrown out by my mother when you know, as sure. everybody goes through. Um, and then I found one thing. It was Zorro on a horse, a uh, little two-inch high Zorro at a flea market. And it opened up the floodgates. It was my, uh, uh, my Proust, my uh, mm. uh, remembrance of things past. Right, and right. this flood of, of uh, intense feelings came up as an adult. And then I was on a, a quest that still continues of collecting these things okay. and making sets out of them. Uh, I, I have on the, uh, the floor of my office, a nine foot long model of the circus Maximus in Rome with all the wow. chariots and all the wow. statues and decorations and temples and everything else, uh, built with, uh, like Lego bricks and Amazing. that sort of thing. Um, and, and I, I have this in depth. I can create historical scenes from about 15 different time periods, the Civil War, dinosaurs, outer space, uh, knights and Vikings, you know, mm -hmm. Romans, whatever. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a whole universe that I share with a few hundred people, mostly guys uh, around the world on Facebook groups. And, and this is a big part of my life now is photographing these things and posting pictures of them. Uh, to the people who appreciate it. So it's, it's another expression of my story impulse. Right. Uh, you know, as I make little, little scenes and stories out of these things. And it's a lot cheaper than filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, Chris, this has been really great for me. I just enjoy talking. And I mean, I, if you're looking for another creative outlet, I, I might suggest you look into podcasting because you're really natural on the other end of the mic. And I'm sure you'd be really natural, 
you know, talking to people you found interesting uh, as well, not to put, put a, yeah. put a, put a, put a weight on you, but um, you know, all the kids are doing it. So <laughs> no, I've been thinking about it. Okay. Uh, I, as I, as I told you before, I, uh, I found, I love being asked questions yeah. about myself. That's great. And, uh, I am uh, curious about people and, and so it makes sense. So I, I'm definitely thinking about going that way. Nice. Yeah. Well, well, how would you suggest people who want to learn more about you? And of course the book, where, where do you like to point people to, uh, to find your, find your written work and, uh, anything else that you're curious for well, putting in the universe? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've got my website down at the moment. Uh, I got to get that back up soon, but the best place to find me these days is, uh, at WordPress. Uh, there is a uh, Chris Vogler's Heroes uh, Writer's Journey, mm-hmm. Chris Vogler's Writer's Journey blog, and uh, that uh, has, has a current article about the Lion King and all the okay. stuff we okay. talked about. Uh, so that's a, a good uh, good spot. Go to WordPress and look for Chris Vogler there. Um, that's the uh, the best source. And then uh, the book keeps churning along, and mm-hmm. uh, we'll soon have this 25th anniversary edition. Uh, with some new material about uh, uh, something we didn't talk about, about the the idea of the chakras, these uh, yeah. spiritual yeah. centers up and down the body. Sure. And uh, this is a, an area I've been developing the last few years uh, to see, is there something useful for writers in that, for thinking about these centers as uh, targets for your emotions? Yeah. So you can a little more consciously... <laughs> aim to open up somebody's heart or to sure. make people choke up in the throat chakra mm-hmm. or to feel some kind of spiritual uplift in the third eye, uh, these, these kind of things. <laughs> so. Well, you just, you just exemplified, you know, of course, is the old, you know, leave them wanting more. And for me, who's a esoteric California hippie type, uh, yeah. you just, you, you just, you just set up the sequel. We'll have to do That's round great. two. As you want to explicate, explicate this idea and kick it around around the yard, I'd be happy to be uh, on the other side of the ball there. Man, Chris, thank you so much. A great pleasure, Brendan. Thank you very much for the opportunity. This has been great fun. Okay, that's the show this week. I am glad to be back. Hope you're glad to be back with me. Don't forget to visit crazyinagoodway.com. Also, you can search the show in any podcatcher to rate, review, subscribe, and share with friends. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next week. Oh, 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 o